so yeah, welcome to this webinar on what's on at the EGU uh, General Assembly. My name is Simon Clark. I'm the Programme Coordinator for EGU. Um, today's webinar will provide insight into the Assembly's organisation, how to engage with key tools like the Virtual Conference Centre and the Pop-Up Networker, the events organised by and for earlier career scientist events from networking short courses, and finally, what opportunities there are for researchers to engage with and influence policy. Our three speakers today is uh, Peter van der Beek, EGU Programmes Committee Chair, Anita Di Chiara, Union Level ECS Representative, and Chloe Hill, EGU Policy Officer. So uh, to begin, can we uh, start with Peter? Let's take it away. Hey. Thank you, Simon, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining in. I will share my screen and so, I'll just give you a little bit of background on uh, EGU 22, which is which will be EGU's first hybrid general assembly. And what I'd like to do is maybe just discuss a little bit first some of the planning and organizing that went into this event and the challenges, but also some of the opportunities that uh, were related to that. I'll give you some key numbers and features of the conference and then just some aspects and tips on attending and networking, whether you are uh, an on-site or an online participant in, uh, in this, this year's General Assembly. So if we just go back a little bit to um, the beginning of this adventure, our initial plan after VEGU 21, last year's completely virtual uh, General Assembly, was to have a nearly, let's say, classical on-site conference with oral speaker and poster sessions as you are you were used to in in previous general assemblies general assemblies at egu and the plan was for the pico sessions to be run as v picos and to be available in hybrid format so that would have been in our initial plan the extent of uh, the hybrid format for uh, this year's general assembly that decision was made based on several uh, reasons. First of all, there appeared to be a very strong preference for an in-person conference in the feedback that we received after VEGU 21. Uh, and also there was a certain hesitation uh, to develop a full hybrid format too hastily, uh, given the uh, logistics and the uh, basically the, the, the constraints, the logistic and the personnel constraints that uh, EGU has and was facing and we'd rather uh, develop something less ambitious but which, which we were sure would work than uh, go too ambitious and have the risk of malfunctioning and probably there might also have been this was all happening uh, last summer maybe a somewhat optimistic assessment of how the pandemic would develop in uh, the months that are now behind us so uh, what happened then towards the end of the year, uh, the end of last year and early this year, obviously, we had the consecutive uh, Delta and Omicron waves, and that led to several things. First of all, a clear apprehension in the community about attending in-person conferences, given the uh, pandemic conditions of last winter but also a rapidly evolving landscape of restrictions being put in place, in particular in Austria and Vienna. And we saw several versions of the 2G or 3G rules. So rules on being vaccinated, tested, or combinations of vaccinated and tested in order to be able to attend large scale events such as the General Assembly. Uh, and importantly, uh, at some point also quite significant event size limitations were put in place. And so making the uh, outlook on a successful in-person uh, part of the General Assembly uh, quite difficult. And so early this year, uh, we then decided to take some drastic steps to postpone EGU 22 from its initial uh, foreseen date in early April to uh, next week in late May, and also to change uh, the format of the meeting. And the new concept was to uh, propose a single format that we call short oral presentations and to make the meeting fully hybrid. 
The reason for that was that it allowed de-risking the meeting hygiene plan because the uh, movement of large groups of people within either picos or poster sessions uh, was deemed a uh, quite a big uh, a hygiene risk, health risk. Uh, and also, the, obviously, this uh, single format allowed the meeting to become fully hybrid and thereby improve the accessibility and the inclusion for those participants who were not able or willing to attend in person. And so, um, so that's how we've moved forward. And this is the current state. So this just shows uh, what to expect at the meeting in, number, in terms of uh, participants. So we currently have 7,280 re un registered on-site participants. And that is pretty much a final number because the on-site registrations are closed. And that's also uh, due to the... Um, to the hygiene uh, plan that we've put in place. We need to know how many people we, we have on site. And so we cannot keep the registrations open until the last minute. And on-site participants uh, are coming from 88 countries. And we currently have about 4,400 virtual registrations. And that number is still uh, uh, going up because virtual registrations will be possible uh, until or throughout the meeting. Uh, and they are coming currently from 107 countries. As you see, the, the makeup of the two groups is fairly similar between regular uh, participants, PhD candidates, uh, retired medalists and undergraduate MSc students. The only clear difference is the larger proportion of undergraduate and MSc students in the virtual attendees. And the reason for that is that like last year, we have a uh, virtual registration fee waiver for those participants, as we have a virtual registration fee waiver for scientists from lower and lower middle income countries. So these, the virtual participants will be able to engage with uh, the uh, General Assembly again through the virtual conference center so like last year it's very much based on last year's design um, except that all the scientific sessions will be run as zoom sessions um, and so you will again have the, the uh, possibility to go to these scientific sessions or the union symposia and great debates the medal and award lecture simply by clicking on uh, these doors and going into these virtual uh, lecture halls and there will be uh, similarly again possibilities for online networking for visiting some of the artists in residence for visiting the short courses town halls splinter meetings jobs and career center uh, etc so basically pretty much the whole spectrum of activities at uh, that are available on site will also be available online for the virtual participants. Just some uh, details of what will be happening and the schedule. So we have currently about 12,600 abstracts in the program, which is a, uh, uh, a small, uh, uh, the number is slightly smaller than, in, uh, than last year. Uh, and these will be presented in uh, 777 active sessions, of which 614 are, let's say, the disciplinary science sections, the short oral sessions. We have 54 short courses, 35 medal and award lectures, uh, 10 union-wide sessions, union symposia and great debates. Uh, we currently have 65 networking and community events that excludes uh, the pop-ups, and I'll come back to the pop-up networking events in a little bit. There will be town hall meetings, side events, splinter meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What you are used to from an EGU General Assembly. There will also be a short plenary on the 23rd of May at noon, and the medal and award celebration is back and that will happen on the 25th of may at the end of the afternoon and you will find all of these uh in the uh in the uh general assembly program online so 
what can you do to prepare and uh, some of the features of the platform on, on which the uh, that supports the conference both on site and uh, and online the first thing to do is upload your display materials and when you do that you can choose if you allow commenting on these which allows a, a scientific discussion beyond uh, what would happen in response to your uh, short oral uh, and you can choose to make these materials open access or uh, restricted access if you choose to make them open access they will be archived in egu sphere uh, at the end of the conference and will be available as open access materials uh, basically perpetually and so how to do that well very simply if you go to your uh, abstracts management page so i'm just showing an example for uh, uh, one of mine here you will see here that you can just by simply clicking this button you can upload the display material and note that that is different from what we call the live presentation which is the uh, uh, material that you will use uh, to support your short oral presentation The other thing that we ask you to do uh, in advance is to indicate your presentation format. So whether you aim to present either in person or virtual, and again, that is very simply done from uh, your abstract management page, page by clicking this uh, radio button here. Uh, and again, you can also upload your presentation through uh, this page. And remember, please to upload the slides for your short oral presentation at least 24 hours in advance to uh, your session. You can obviously uh, already prepare your personal program and that is something I would really encourage you to do so that you have an ID. There is so much going on during uh, this EGU week next week that if you are prepared, you will uh, have a better experience and, and be more uh, effective in getting the most out of the uh, of the meeting and you can do that in advance by preparing your personal program for the week uh, and you can also set up your networker by uh, filling in your profile your profile information uh, decide what you want others to see you can add people from your network using their email address uh, and you can then start chats or uh, meet on other platforms with your online connections at any time and obviously also uh, in the in-person meeting set up uh, in-person meetings with uh, your colleagues if you wish and so we introduced last year uh, what we call pop-up networking events which are informal and spontaneous uh, networking events uh they they were actually happening beforehand but uh last year given that it was a virtual meeting we needed to have a uh a, a platform on which we were able to organize these and we've decided to perpetuate that platform yeah you know, also in a hybrid session uh in a hybrid meeting and so uh that allows programming on-site, off-site, or virtual networking events uh, during the meeting. And so you can check the pop-up networking program, uh, which is part of the meeting program, which you will find on uh, the website. And I'm just uh, showing you an, an example here. So you can filter these by tags, and then they are just uh, indicated by day and so you can see for instance this is an off-site networking event that is going to be uh, happening in the stop park uh, he here on monday you have an on-site networking event in the uh, networking zone that we defined and then finally here you have a virtual networking event that will be available uh, online right so you can scroll through these you can see what categories you are interested in and i would uh, strongly encourage you to uh, check out these uh, these pop-up networking events. You can also schedule your own uh, pop-up networking event, and you can do this very simply directly from the EGU 22 landing page, so from the General Assembly landing page. Uh, and if you go to that page, you will just simply find this uh, button here that allows you to uh, directly schedule a networking event, whether 
you want that to be on site in the Austria center, off site somewhere else in Vienna or uh, online only. So these are just some of uh, the features and, uh, and possibilities. Uh, thank you for your attention for this short presentation. I very much hope to see all of you uh, either on site in Vienna or online next week. And I'm obviously open to questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, next, Anita, could you uh, discuss your perspective on UCS-led events? Yes, thanks, Simon. So hi all, I'm Anita Di Chiara, Union uh, Level Early Career Scientist Representative. And I have here a short uh, overview of some of the activities offered uh, to early career scientists, uh, some of them also organized by early career scientists. And the, the, um, so and is in this short lineup, I also like to, to uh, give some tips on how to get involved. Um, the, the definition for EGU, what is an early career scientist, is a PhD uh, candidate, a student, a practice scientist who received their highest certificate within the past seven years. But this seven years period can be extended uh, to include periods that scientists were not working in science because of several reasons, say caring responsibilities, parental responsibilities, disabilities, illnesses, community obligations, national service. Uh, the RCS, um, the Air Career Scientists, are um, more or less more than 50% of the EGU membership, as you saw also on the on the on Peter's uh, slides. And um, we um, ACS are part of the EGU organizations. You can reach your uh, ECS representative for your division, and there are of course 22 of them as the divisions. And uh, some, in some divisions, uh, the representatives also lead a group of, of, um, of people taking care of the social media or writing blogs and organizing other activities across the year, like campfires and webinars. And there are also a working group, balance working group, jobs and careers working group, connectivity and pride. Um, this, uh, sorry, these working groups also, of course, organize a set of activities for uh, engaging with the early career community uh, during the uh, General Assembly upcoming. If it's the first time you're attending the General Assembly, there are a series of uh, a webinar already available that Simon edited and you are welcome to check on the YouTube page. I recommend you do that. They are very well done. And um, the, I add, I'm adding here some QR code you're free to scan, some example. Um, there is, say, for instance, a blog and a webinar for first time you're convening a EGU session. And, um, and so you can check that out. I would also uh, reiterate that it would be really useful this year to organize your program in advance because uh, there are several activities. and. Um, this is, I think, is a good advice for try not to uh, miss what's going on, what you're, um, what you're uh, uh, participating in the General Assembly uh, for, to engage with the community, not only to present the, your science, uh, which we're very much looking forward, but also to connect with the community. And to be honest, after two years online, I really look forward to, to, to be in person. And if you are participating online, you should not be excluded. There are a series of, of activities as well for you. And also recommend if you're coming in person to download the map of the venue as the first time, it could be a little bit uh, uh, overwhelming finding your way around the Vienna Center. Um, if you have opened your, um, your program uh, tool to set, there is some union-wide level um, events and that Peter already mentioned, and I would like to go very quickly in, in, into a, a, like explaining some of them, uh, of course, beyond your scientific sessions. And so I would like to say um, 
um, what is, say, a union symposium, they would cover general topics. And I like to give some real examples, like uh, Chloe's, uh, Chloe Hill's um, EU Union Symposium number two, which is on Monday, on the role of geosciences in preserving and restoring biodiversity. She will probably explain better than me on this. And say on Tuesday, there is a Union Symposium on Future of Geoscientific Conferences, which is timely. And there are others, so I welcome you to check those. And there are uh, a set of great debates that are really interesting. And one is ECS led, and it's on uh, fixed, fixed term contracts. Are they opportunity or exploitation? And you can, you can scan the code and, and add that to your program. And there are also the medal lectures that is really a great moment to, um, to see what, you, what your fellow CCS are presenting and, and get informed also on how you can get more engaged on that aspect. Um, and there are, of course, one ECS award that the, uh, un the union level, but also your division has um, as a medal lectures for ACS from ACS that won the award last year. Short courses are uh, the format of the short courses is not like a, a scientific session. It's it's a it's a course. It's um in, in it can be organized um, in different formats um, in say, in a more interactive format as a panel discussion or, um, or um, a set of speakers. And then there is time for question and answers at the end of the session or during. They're usually quite interactive and fun. And um, some are addressed for um, everyone, just, um, regardless the division. Um, for instance, um, uh, there is on Monday, uh, how to navigate EGU, tips and tricks. Um, and I added the QR code so you can add that. Um, and this is for not only early career scientists, but it's for everybody. Um, and I, I give a short course uh, on Tuesday, how to get involved with EGU. It is for everyone, but tailored more towards early career scientists. It is, these are all hybrid events so that you can also attend uh, online. Some others are also interesting. I'll give you some example, for instance, how to build and grow your scientific network. network. Um, it's on Monday again, and there is some um, other set of uh, other two short courses organized by the work-life balance group. Um, uh, this, for instance, this one um, scared the beginning of presentations. I think it's timely seeing the new format of the of the of the general assembly this year, where there are no posters, and so there's going to be some tips and tricks and some speakers talking about several aspects. And you can find here uh, again the QR code. Um, and there is another short course which is also interesting. Is is meet the EGU journal editors. Um, and you can have the QR code there, and it's on Tuesday again, and it's co-organized, so it's really across divisions. Uh, welcome to participate in that as well. And there are several that are organized for your divisions. Um, you you're welcome to to go more of say check for your division level, but say seismology 101, geodesy 101, geology 101, and more, many more. Um, um, there are also networking events, and as Peter said, um, there are networking events and pop-up networking events. Networking events are uh, marked as net in the program, and for instance, there is the first-time attendees on Monday, the business lounge, and I just put here a map of where this event is with the metro station reference and in the red part uh, where it's a business lounge. Uh, you can do this exercise for the, all the other sessions and events. You can see the room, room numbers in this map and you see the colors. So if you were to download the map, each floor has a color. And so you can, uh, and then close to each event, you see the room number and the color if you are attending in person. And that's, uh, I think, is a nice uh, thing to know. Um, and there is a networking also uh, early career um, networking reception. I think you need to register for that. 
um, check all the description is there online and um, the QR code is there. Um, and then uh, there is the uh, Eric Curry Scientist Forum. Uh, it's, this is on Thursday, and it's a time where you welcome to share feedback and hear more about um, the, the early career from, from the early career scientist representatives and from myself and the, and the, and the, and the upcoming early career scientist uh, representative, Jenny Thornton. And um, it's going to be a, a good time for you to also um, you know, share your ideas and, and meet us. Uh, so the pop-up network events are more of a spontaneous events. And so while you can add these networking events to your program with a little star, yellow star, these networking events, you can add them into your personal calendar or as mm, you can, there is a button you can add some meetings, personal meetings to your personal program. And as Peter already showed, there are some that are organized for division. So you, I hope you did, you participate already uh, to last year uh, EGU, but there were some early career scientists led on the division base. Um, and so you can go and check for your division what's, what's on, it could be a dinner, it could be a networking online, um, it could be a, yeah, I don't know, a meeting in the park, a picnic. You, you're welcome to scroll down the menu to, for to looking for them. In this case, for instance, in the first line, the first line is from the GD, PS, and SM, SM division together <laughs> outside um, the Vienna, outside the Vienna Centrum offsite. There are others that are in, that are inside the Vienna Centrum. And others that are online. Um, so on Monday, on Monday there are there are there are several events, and, and as I show you, there's say HS uh, events and some um, some events organized by the by the work life balance group, and also stay on Tuesday on the same line. There's move, stretch, and lunch in the park, um, and online site of on site. Networking picnic for ST divisions, early career scientists. Um, I I would not have the time to list them all. I add like plus three or plus five. But the nature of pop up in a networking event is that you can go ahead and book and and organize your one. So these numbers will likely be greater than uh, than the the number say for instance eight for for the Tuesday. Uh, on Thursday, there is picnic lunch, and there is also time for Jody's division plus other four events. Um, and as Peter said, so you can schedule your own. You just need to provide the event title, a description for the event where you can add, if it's online, say, uh, an inform more information, maybe a Zoom link or in whichever platform you wish to, to do to organize that. Um, and you need to, so you can select even tags. So if the event is related to policy, health, uh, health and wellness, or to early career scientists, if it's a social event, or if it's an EDI event, and uh, schedule, and you can just hit the button, and it's going to be in the program. You can modify it as soon as, as, soon as uh, you want. And for, um, sorry. And for um, uh, another tip, um, tip I would like to give is to also come and check in person. Uh, there is going to be an EDI booth and a, an EGU booth where it's going to be staffed and people are there to, to meet you and talk about uh, uh, topics that are dear to you. And so it's a, it's a nice time to, to you know, have a chat uh, what you care about and or get more information about what's going on. Um, I would like to, on this purpose, I would like also to um, suggest you check also all the EOS events that, uh, that uh, regards um, other topics that may look uh, unrelated to, the, to, to your science, but are still very important. Um, with this, I would like to uh, say goodbye and hope to see you soon online uh, or in person. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Um,
to move on to our final speaker today, which is Kerry Hill, who's here to discuss, uh, discuss um, policy related events and opportunities at the General Assembly next week. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> um, so I think I've already started sharing my screen. Can you see that okay? Yeah, I can see it fine. Amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, so today I am going to be talking about the different science and policy sessions and activities that you can, you can engage with during EGU 22. Um, as the EGU's policy manager, I'm responsible for overseeing these and creating different sessions each year. We have had these science and policy sessions now for over seven years, the ones that have been organised by the EGU office. But of course, policy sessions have happened um, throughout the years at the General Assembly. And it's because policy is a really relevant topic to science. Um, for example, scientists can contribute a lot to the policymaking process by sharing relevant information in a way that policymakers can understand and use. Um, and on the flip side of that, we also have policy for science, which is related to research funding and that sort of thing. So it is a very important topic. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about the different ways you can engage with it at the General Assembly this year. Um, so the things I'm gonna be talking about today are the different sessions that expand your knowledge about science and policy and how you can engage with policymaking. Um, the opportunities that will exist both online and in person at the General Assembly to actually meet these policymakers and those who are working on the interface of science and policy. And then I'll also mention some of the activities that you can engage with after EGU 22 has finished. And these are activities you might want to start engaging with during the week of EGU 22 and then continue to engage with after that. So... The science and policy sessions at EGU 22 are quite broad. There's a lot of different types um, and they all cover different topics. So the short courses, as Anita talked about in her presentation, give practical tips about how you can more effectively engage the policymaking process and share your expertise as a scientist. So we do these every year and every year they do have a slightly different focus. Um, this year we're really lucky to actually have some experts coming to General Assembly to talk about their role in the science policy interface, and also some of the research that they've put together on this about how scientists can best engage. So the role of scientific institutions in policymaking is actually going to be run by um, Lena Topp, who is a member of the EGU's Science Policy Working Group, um, but she's also working within, within the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. Um, and they've recently put together a framework of all the different competencies and skills that scientific institutions can build collectively to make them more effective at getting involved in policymaking. Um, so it's you know, not just one set sort of skills that one individual can build, but things you can do collectively to improve your ability to engage with these policymakers and to have an impact in the policymaking process. So that's going to be a really, really exciting session. Um, it's going to be at 8.30 um, on Wednesday morning, so quite early, but it will be worth it. In that session, we'll also have Ilias Grampus, who is working within the European Parliament's intergroups to comment on some of those skills and how he personally either uses them or finds them useful when scientists use them. So um, a couple of experts there. The other short course that I'm going to be highlighting today is how to influence policy through engaging with parliaments. So this will also be held on the Wednesday in the afternoon. And again, we also have some experts coming in to talk about this. So we have someone coming in from the UK's Knowledge Exchange Unit, which works within the UK Parliament to talk about their work. Um, we have someone from STOA, which is the works within the Parliament um, of the EU as well. And then someone coming in from the Austrian side. So there are actually some experts who are working within these processes to share their top tips with you about how you as a scientist can start engage, engaging more effectively. Um, the union-wide sessions that Anita also mentioned are some other great examples of um, science for policy and actually the practical uses of science for policy. So not so much focusing on skills, but very much focusing on the big issues, the big topics, and how science can be integrated into those big decisions that policymakers have to make. Um, so the role of geosciences in preserving and restoring biodiversity is a big one. Um, and this one is going to be on the Monday, and I think it's starting at, at 
and it has a fantastic lineup of speakers, a very, very exciting panel. Um, we have some people coming from the European Commission. We have some people working within these processes who are really going to explain the biodiversity policy landscape and where scientists fit into that. So hopefully after listening to or engaging with that human symposia, you can walk away and have a bit more of an understanding about how you as a scientist can get involved in that landscape as well. Um, the other one I've listed here is on the Friday, so bookending the week. Um, and it's all about climate change um, and what it means for the earth science community. So again, we'll have a mixed panel there. It's very much gonna be focusing on the practical aspects of what scientists can be doing. And the last thing I've listed here is all of the different policy related scientific sessions. So these are the sessions that you would have submitted an abstract to, for example, but we do have some that are specifically focusing on policy this year as well. Now, if you want a, an, an overarching list of all of these different sessions and more, I will actually drop a link into the chat that gives you an overview of um, the sessions that I think are most policy relevant that will be happening throughout EG22. So I'll put that into the chat for anyone who is listening to this live and maybe Simon also wants to add it to the YouTube description once he uploads it onto YouTube. Great. So it's not just science and policy sessions that you can get involved with during EG22. We also have a range of activities. And I think this is something that's really important now that we are starting to come out of COVID, um, starting to have a hybrid session, which is very exciting, like Peter talked about. So we have, um, the first one I have here is the Ask a Policy Expert Program. Now, if you are listening to this live, please go and apply for this today because the deadline is at midnight. Um, once you submit your questions, so your specific policy questions, what exactly do you want to know? If you could talk to someone who is working on the science for policy in space, what would you ask them? So ask these questions and then I will pair you with someone who I think is able to answer them or at least try to answer them and to talk to you. So you can either meet in person in Vienna or you can meet online if you're attending virtually. So I really do encourage you to apply for that today if you are listening to this live. Um, the second thing here I want to list is something that obviously Anita talked about as well is the ECS networking event. Um, I'm making sure the people who are attending um, those sessions I mentioned on Wednesday will be at this event as well. So you might be able to talk to them about how they got involved with the science policy interface or what career steps they took. Um, and the last one I have on the screen is actually the EGU's Science and Policy Help Desk. Now this will be every day at the EGU booth from 11 until 12. And if for some reason you didn't meet, for example, the Ask a Policy Expert deadline, which is today, did I mention that? I mentioned it. Um, then you can come along to the help desk from 11 until 12 every single day, and there will be experts there to answer your questions and to have a more general policy discussion as well. Um, so the benefit of the Ask a Policy Expert scheme is that the people you'll be talking to already are aware of your questions, and they're going to know how, how to answer them because they would have thought about them a bit in advance. At the, the Science Policy Help Desk, it might not be so clear cut, but you will be able to have a discussion with someone about those. So I do encourage you to come along. And even if you just wanna say hi, or you wanna collect some resources that we'll have there, you're more than welcome to just drop in. And the final thing I wanna to mention today is some of the science or policy activities that you can engage with post EGU 22. So these are things we'll be highlighting throughout the week of the GA, and some of them are quite new. I think that's all of them are quite new, so they're very exciting. Um, the first one is the EGU Science for Policy Hangouts. So these, if any of you listening attended our Science for Policy Happy Hour last year or the year before last, similar to that, but we're going to be holding these on a more frequent basis and they're going to be a little bit earlier in the day. They're going to be hosted every second month and we'll make sure we have some policy experts in the room or science policy experts in the room who can answer questions. And it'll be a way of getting to know people or meet them virtually and have a discussion with them about some of the challenges you're facing in terms of engaging with policymakers or some of the opportunities that you've had. So it'll be very informal, but they are starting in July and will be held every second Thursday, uh, every second month on the first Thursday of the month. So they are already online um, if you go to the webinars page. The second one I wanna talk about here is the EGU's Biodiversity Task Force Survey. So EGU does have a biodiversity task force. Biodiversity is our, the EGU's policy priority area. 
And we'd like, also really like to get your feedback during the General Assembly. If you're working in biodiversity or you think there's a particular area we'd like to touch on, we do have a survey we'll be sharing during the General Assembly during specific sessions that relate to biodiversity so that you can answer a survey and highlight the areas that you think are important. The other one, the next one we have is the EGU's Science Policy Pairing Scheme, um, which will be open, I hope, the application period will be open by next week. Um, so this is where you will be paired with a member of the European Parliament and you'll be working with them for a week inside the Parliament. So this is something the EGU has done for the last couple of years. It was put on hold last year as a result of COVID and we will be restarting it this year. And we are hoping to have two pairs this year paired with two different MEPs. Um, there's also the EGU's Science Policy event, which will be held in the Parliament in late September. So this will focus on biodiversity and um, it is open for everyone to attend, but it will be in Brussels and it will be in person. So you can find out more about this at the General Assembly next week. And finally, if you want to hear more about these opportunities, you can sign up for the EGU's Science Policy Newsletter, which is published every month with the latest opportunities and news about policy. So that is all I have for you today. But if you have any questions, please do free, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my, my email is policy at egu.eu. And um, yeah, happy to answer any questions that you have now. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, maybe you can put them in the chat down below, comment section down below. Right. Thanks, Simon. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, do you have some time for a few questions? Before I do, I just want to highlight the fact that if you're engaging with EG online, um, you can do so by using our hashtags, which is hashtag EGU22, hashtag VEGU22, or hashtag EGU underscore, followed by your division name. Um, I also should note that there is a mentor and mentee scheme. Um, if those who are involved should consider attending the first time attendees meetup, which is an informal drop-in event on, uh, I believe, in Monday, um, which you can drop in at any time during that session to uh, meet with your mentor. Um, yeah, so to move on to some questions. Um, just a few other ones I've had in. Um, as we finish with policy, let's start with policy. Um, so for Chloe, so can anyone attend these policy sessions even if they have no experience? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I would say we basically, especially during the short courses, we really do start from the ground level. Um, we do build up from that quite quickly. So if you have attended um, policy sessions before or you already have a good base knowledge about science or policy, um, you won't get bored, you will be learning new things. Um, but the first five or 10 minutes of every session is definitely more of an introduction to make sure that everyone is on the same page, has the same the level of knowledge about what science policy is that they need. Um, and there's always this space at the end of every session that we hold that relates to policy um, for questions. And yeah, it's, it's really important, I think, to have that, that time. And if you do want to know more after a session has finished, we always, you're always welcome to drop by the help desk from 11 until 12 every day and have further discussions. Um, and yeah, everyone is welcome. And I think it depends where your interests are. But for example, if you are working on climate change or biodiversity, those that union symposia and great debate, highly recommended. Um, and that really is a topic I think that everyone can relate to on some level. So. Excellent, so pretty much any session if you have any session, you know, everyone yeah. should come all the time. Yes. <laughs> um, Anita, I've got one um, about being an ECS attendee who might want to um, join with ECS division teams, perhaps get more involved with what's going on at EGU. Um, how can ECS members attending the assembly perhaps do this do so? How can they get more involved with what the ECS reps and their teams are doing? Uh, thanks for this question. Is uh, it's uh, really important because this is what we'd like to is to reach uh, the ECS community. Uh, so there are uh, several ways during the general assembly. I mentioned uh, that you could um, find and recommend you do so uh, the, your networking events at division level. 
So if you're attending online, there will pr probably be an ECS networking event for your division. Uh, some of them may be outside of the week of the General Assembly, but most of them are during. Uh, you can check that in the program. And there is also network events in person. Um, you, can, you can check the program for that. And um, for the rest of the activities, you can, you can find, you can contact uh, either myself as union level uh, via email uh, anytime you want. And we are also very active on Twitter, on Facebook. And so you're welcome to contact us through those channels as well. And uh, I'll be around the uh, assembly. You're welcome to, you know, to introduce yourself and ask more questions, whatever you want. And also in the EGU website, you can find the contact of your division with level representative um, for the early career scientists. I encourage you to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, so I guess the key thing is, is don't be afraid to approach people. Um, many of the ECS reps will be there physically. Um, you'll also help me able to meet some of them at the ECS reception, um, which requires registration if you wish to attend on the Tuesday. Um, and also other events as well, such as the ECS forum that Anita has previously mentioned. Um, so moving on to another question I have. Um, is, I think it's pretty related to the one I actually just asked is how can attendees learn more about what EGU does at the assembly? Um, who's best to take that one? Uh, perhaps Peter, do you, is that something you can have input on? If someone attends the assembly and perhaps wants to see what the actual organization does beyond the scientific sessions? Yes, so uh, a good place to start would be the EGU booth that will be uh, in the um, uh, exhibition in the exhibition area and there will be throughout the week there will be EG representatives present at the booth so both uh, uh, people from the EG office and some of the volunteers who are uh, uh, working as the division presidents or the, the in the different committees so uh, that would be an excellent place to start uh, there will be the uh, a uh, fairly short, but there will be a uh, plenary on the Monday at noon. Uh, I believe it will be in room E1. Uh, so that's also a good place to uh, get uh, some general information on uh, the union and on uh, and on what is done. Uh, I would also strongly encourage people to go to the relevant division meetings. Uh, which will be held either during the week, uh, mostly during the lunchtime slot, or online. And some of the online meetings will already be uh, running this week, so check the program for those. Uh, that's also an excellent place to start to get to better know uh, EGU and the different activities. And don't hesitate to talk to people and to, uh, you know, if you're interested in a particular committee or a particular aspect, uh, talk to the relevant people, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to talk to you and uh, get you get you involved. Excellent. So again, plenty of opportunities. Um, and if you have a loss, Sorry. go to the EG booth and ask there. Yeah. Okay. Can I add something? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, you're welcome to attend the, uh, the short courses that are tailored to this question. Uh, so how to attend EGU, tip and tricks, and how to get involved with EGU. And so this also would be a good place to, uh, to come if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Um, so you have time for one more question. Um, I might as well bring this full circle to ask about policy, and it's what policy experts are attending? Oh, that is a very good question. I've got to say this year, we had some of the most exciting science and policy experts that we've, we've ever had actually. And that's in large part, thanks to Peter and the, the program committee. Um, they've opened that up for us, which has been really nice. So for example, on Monday, um, we will have Philip Tolkens, who is the head of unit for the climate and boundaries um, directorate general within the European Commission. So he will actually be attending the General Assembly for a couple of days. He'll be speaking in the union symposia and then he also really wants to chat with some scientists and get some feedback so he'll also have a splinter meeting while he's there 
he'll be joining us on the help desk. And um, a couple of members of his team will also be at the General Assembly as well. So you can actually meet with people who are working on these issues within the commission, um, which I think is really exciting. We'll also have Gregoire Dubois, who is the manager of the EU Knowledge, Knowledge Centre for Biodiversity, which again is working within the commission. Um, but he will be there in person at the General Assembly to discuss how scientists can get more involved in those sorts of programs. And he was also in a former life scientist. So he's also an EGU member or was an EGU member at some point. So he can actually really connect with scientists as well. And he understands where scientists are coming from. Um, we then have a lot of representatives from the EGU's Science and Policy Working Group who will be there. And these again are people who know about EGU because they are part of our working group and they know um, sort of about our scientists and what their motivations might be. But they're also people who work with policy. So if you have any questions, again, these people will be around the General Assembly in person and they will also be at the EGU Science and Policy Help Desk. Thank you, Chloe. Yeah, so some big names attending at the Assembly this year. Um, I think that's it for questions. So I'll wrap this webinar up. I'll say thank you to our three speakers coming in to talk about a diverse range of things going on at the Assembly next week. Uh, thank you for everyone attending and for watching YouTube. Um, otherwise, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.